Thank you everyone for joining us for today's presentation, Five Ways to Take Disaster Out of Disaster Recovery. Before we get started, just a quick uh, housekeeping announcement. We are going to send you a copy of this presentation afterward. You're going to receive a copy of these slides as well as a replay of the video as we are recording. Um, hopefully everyone enjoyed their pizza and received that delivery all right. If you had any problems with that pizza delivery, then use the question tool in GoToWebinar to let us know. Also throughout the presentation, please ask lots of questions using that question tool. We are doing a giveaway at the end of this presentation. And as you may have seen in the invite, it's going to be an Xbox One given to the best question asked during the Q&A. So be sure to ask lots of questions for that. So let's take a quick look at the agenda before we dive in. First, we're going to be talking about trends in data protection in 2015. Then we'll look at five ways to take disaster out of disaster recovery. We'll talk just a bit about InfraScale, and then we'll have the Q&A in that prize giveaway. And your host today, uh, my name is Carla Federigo, and I'm the Online Marketing Manager at InfraScale, and also Dean Nichols, who's the VP of Demand Generation here at InfraScale. So we'll be your hosts, and I think that with that, we'll dive right in. Now first, we have a quick poll. We just like to be able to tailor this presentation uh, based on our audience here. And so we'd like to give appropriate examples throughout the presentation. So in just one second, you're going to see a poll on your screen here. So you should be seeing that poll come up just now. So if you could um, just reach over and answer that poll question, we're asking, to tell us a little bit about you. So far we have 71% of you who voted, 73% now have voted. Now we're up past 80% voted, so thank you everyone for your participation with this. It looks like uh, the answers here, 26% of you um, are in the 0 to 100 range of employee size. 31% uh, had said 100 to 500. 9% have said 500 to 1,000, and then 29% have said 1,500 plus. Great, thank you everyone for participating in that, much appreciated. Now let's see if we can dive into the presentation. So first we're gonna start with trends in data protection in 2015. So this first trend that we're going to look at, we're calling living with a false sense of security. Now, experiencing downtime can really hurt a business, and in fact, it could put an organization out of business. But more business professionals are living with a false sense of security today. So they think that they have a backup system in place, and they think that they're covered. But what we've found is that there is a major mismatch between the importance of data protection and disaster recovery and the amount of preparation in place. So let's take a look at a couple of these steps. Now, we're not going to go through the entire page, but just a few of the key points. So Gardner Research has found that 70% of businesses aren't confident with the statement, our backup and disaster recovery operations are well managed and planned. 98% of businesses cannot survive more than one day of downtime. And in fact, if you're a smaller company, being down for 24 hours is definitely going to kill your business. The last stat on the page here, IDC has found that the average cost of downtime is $20,000 per hour. So ask yourself, is that something that you're willing to risk? And hopefully you've joined this webinar today because the answer is no. An InfraScale can make it a lot easier to put a disaster recovery and failover system in place, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Great. And so the, the next trend is really the risk of fragmentation, right? On the left-hand side shows what it looked like 10 years ago, where all your data was really within the same data center and it was easy to protect. Backup was simple since everything, the apps, the CRM billing, was all on-premise. Nobody was too worried about the laptops because they were company-owned and they were running Windows and connected to a VPN into your data center. And most of the files were, were still in the data center. Everything you saw, you could actually protect. But getting up to speed with today, if you look on the right-hand side, it's a whole, it's a complete mess, right? 
Now we have apps in the cloud as well as on-premise. People are bringing in their own devices. They have Windows, they have Macs, they have tablets and smartphones, some of which are company-owned, and some of which are personal devices, right, that they're using to create data. And then again, you have some servers are being physical, some are virtual, increasingly number um, are virtualized, right? And all of this, and companies are having their developers spinning up new VMs all the time. All of this is, is messy, and all this leads to coverage gaps um, in data backup, and that leads to risk, risk to your business and risk to you. So in today's world, data is a lot more fragmented, and there's a lot more risk involved. Now, believe it or not, backup vendors are actually making this even messier, and they're trying to pigeonhole users into either a cloud-based or an appliance-based backup system by offering a sucker's choice. Now, when Dean and I talked to uh, Ken Shaw, our CEO, about this, he said, well, what's a sucker's choice and hadn't heard of it? So a sucker's choice is a choice between two alternatives with the false premise that those are the only two options available. But with InfraScale, you now have a viable option C. So backup vendors are really doing this to IT professionals all the time, the sucker's choice, saying, do you want a backup system or do you want a DR system? Because you simply can't have both. Or do you want on-premise backup or do you want cloud backup? You can't have both. But again, we don't buy into this approach. We think that companies have a third option. So let's look at these uh, two options between cloud-based backup and appliance-based backup. So cloud backup has a lot of benefits, like you see here. It's immediately up and running. It has unlimited capacity. It's redundant and resilient, and it's omnipresent, so you can access it anywhere. But cloud backup has a lot of drawbacks, like slow upload time, slow recovery, the data leaves your network, and you have to trust the vendor security. Now, appliance backup, on the other hand, has its own set of both positives and negatives. So it supports large data sets. You have data sovereignty and know exactly where that data is sitting. Quick recovery, and you can back up to many locations. But it has its drawbacks, too. Capacity planning is difficult. You never know if you're going to get it right, so you generally over or underestimate how much you're going to need. It's expensive, and the hardware is fragile, so it eventually will fail. Management is also a constant struggle when dealing with multiple appliances and dealing with system updates. So it simply begs the question of, why can't we have a solution that combines the benefits of cloud, the benefits of hardware appliances, but eliminates the drawbacks and the limitations of both? So the next big trend is really DRAS, and that's we view it as being the next step in the data protection kind of evolution. If we think about the natural progression and evolution of backup, right, it looks a little bit like this. First of all, we started with tape, and that was the primary way that we were protecting data. But it was still unreliable and still is. In fact, some 20 to 25 percent of companies still rely on tape backup as their primary method of data protection. Now, then there was disk backup, and that became popular. Um, and it's a better solution, but it was so expensive, right? If you need more space, you buy a bigger appliance. Then came cloud backup, which is cheaper, easy, and reliable, but on the other hand, it's really slow um, from both a backup and recovery standpoint if you're dealing with large amounts of data. And then most recently came the evolution of the hybrid cloud, something that combines the benefits of disk, but it's cheaper. And it also includes the benefits of the cloud, which makes it faster. So you end up with something that's reliable, affordable, and fast. So now as we kind of move into and head towards 2016, really the, the best data protection paradigm that you can have is, is one that leverages DRAS, or disaster recovery as a service, something that we think should offer push-button failover. So not only do you have your backups, but you can have failover on the appliance or in the cloud and be able to fail over critical applications in less than 15 minutes. Okay, but what's interesting about DRAS is that it's not well understood. And in this survey of 350 companies, ranging from 100 to 5,000 employees, most businesses said that they couldn't fail over to a second location. In fact, only 10% of the companies surveyed said that they could fail over within 15 minutes. 
So why haven't they invested in failover? Well, the number one reason that was holding them back is the perceived cost of disaster recovery solutions. After that, we saw reliability, complexity, and security were limiting adoption. But the overwhelming reason, as you can see on this graph on the right, is the cost. So we're going to come back to this later in the presentation. And we actually just had this question come up. Stephen asked, um, isn't unlimited capacity also a cost issue as well? And that's something that we are going to talk about in just a minute. Um, finally, on this survey, last note is that if you want a copy of this report, we're happy to share it with you. Please use that question tool and type in to let us know that you want a copy of the report, and we'll go ahead and we'll send it over your way. Great. So now we're going to talk about really the headline um, of the whole webinar, which was five ways to take out disaster out of disaster recovery. Um, there's always going to be some angst whenever a server crashes. Um, but the point of these um, methods is to show you how you can limit that, um, that worry, those concerns, knowing that you're well prepared. So the first one, the first method to take DR or disaster out of disaster recovery is finding a solution that doesn't fall short. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you, typically, if you look at the different ways that people use to kind of um, perform DR, you know, they often will they'll look at archiving, they'll back up DR and failover, and it's very considered that most will want to evaluate these based on several values, whether it be RTO, RPO, security, and cost. Um, let me first explain some of those terms. By RTO, I'm really referring about the recovery time objective, and it's related to downtime. Kind of this metric refers to the amount of time it takes you to recover the data um, from a data loss and how long it takes to return to service, right? RTO really is the amount of time the system, the system's data is unavailable or inaccessible, right, preventing normal use. What RPO stands for recovery point objective, and this refers to the amount of data at risk. It's usually determined by the, the amount of time between a data protection event, or your server's going down, and reflects the amount of data that potentially could be lost during a disaster recovery, right? So the metric is usually, RPO is usually used as an indication of the amount of data at risk of, of being lost. Right, now, when you look at this chart, um, we, we use these five circles, right? And one circle um, filled in is, is not so good. What you really want is all five um, filled in. And so as you move kind of across, you might notice a trend um, is that Archive doesn't have a great RTO or RPO or even security, but it's not that expensive either. Um, as you move to the right, Failover has a great RTO and great RPO but it's easily the highest in terms of price. Of course, what we really want is what you see here at the bottom. And this is kind of a solution that offers a fantastic RTO, a fantastic RPO, all at a low price that we can afford. And at the top of that, we really want to be able to fail over in just minutes, using more of the cloud and less hardware, with security built right in. Now, this is a bit of an eye chart, and I'm not going to go through, through all of it with you. Um, but here's some examples of how many vendors, um, the different methods that vendors use um, or people use and what they consider DR in different instances. Some might be considered failover, um, while others probably are not. What's important is to look at this as a pattern. Like, we just proved that we wanted. What we wanted was to have those circles filled in, right? We wanted a fantastic RTO, a great RPO, security baked in, all at a low price. But we simply don't see that combination anywhere on this chart. Current DR methods are really just falling short. You know, in other words, none of the current methods of disaster recovery actually fit what we're really looking for. What Everscale delivers to you is a solution that doesn't fall short. And we'll see how in just a few minutes. All right, let's dive into number two, the second way to take disaster out of disaster recovery, and that's to get a solution that isn't expensive and complex. Now, we just saw what Dean showed us, that some vendors can achieve the RTO and the RPO that we want, but they just simply don't achieve the cost that we want. Why is that? Well, here on the left, you see how most DR solutions are architected. So you have a production site that replicates to the failover site, as you see here. Now, because of the bandwidth, the people, and the software involved, 
this can cost up to three times as much to set up a DR solution. On top of the expense to implement, it's complex to test and use, and it's vulnerable to hackers since security just isn't built in. So what InfraScale delivers to you is the business benefit of failover, but at the price point of backup. Now let's look at the InfraScale way, a better, a better way to do this. So here are some end users that are working and unknown to them. They're about to experience an unexpected disaster. So those red X's that you just saw pop up symbolize the disaster right when everything goes down. Now, what are they supposed to do? So you're the one that has to deal with this. And it could literally happen at any time, even in the middle of the night. But you simply log in from any laptop, tablet, really any browser. You can recover the entire environment, virtualize any of the servers that are down, boot and run either on the appliance or in the cloud, and everyone keeps working. So this whole process can happen in just one minute. And Dean's going to show you a demo here coming up so that you can see this in real time. Now, the genius of all this is that it's easy enough for a fourth grader because it's push button failover from anywhere for any type of environment. So you can boot on the appliance or in the cloud and it supports VMware, Hyper-V, Windows, and Linux. And you can recover in 15 minutes or less. We give that a guarantee to all of our customers. So we give the assurance to fail over to a second location in 15 minutes in the case of a disaster. And again, we'll, we'll show you that in the demo. But better yet, we'd love to also provide you with a free evaluation of this. So we'll talk about that um, before the end of the presentation. But if anyone is interested in a free evaluation, let us know in that question tool. And we'll go ahead and get that set up for you. So we're going to do one more quick poll here. Um, failover disaster recovery. Which of these is you? So I'm going to launch this poll. If you could please participate in this one. Just three options here. So when it comes to failover disaster recovery, which one is you? A, I can fail over to a second site in under 60 minutes already. B, I wish I had failover DR but can't afford it. C, I don't think I need failover DR. So far we have 40% of you who voted. Please go ahead and vote. I'll give you just a minute to go ahead and vote on this one. Looks like 61% of you have voted so far, but I am seeing the high majority are choosing B. I wish I had failover DR, but I simply can't afford it. And that's the high majority. 61% of you have chosen B, 30% of you chose A, and just 9% of you said, I don't think I need failover DR. For those nine of you, I'm very curious why. All right, let me go ahead and close this poll so that we can continue on with the presentation. Yeah, one thing, Carla, this is very much um, in line with what we found in that, that DRAS report, the adoption report. It's roughly 61, 65% of people didn't adopt um, a failover solution for the very reason that they couldn't afford it, or at least they didn't think they could afford it. Right, and hopefully we'll, we'll explain that actually you can't afford it now. Um, so let me talk about the third way, right, you can take disaster out of disaster recovery. What you really need is a DR solution that doesn't ignore lots of data. Now this may seem somewhat self-explanatory, but let's talk about how data is ignored. A big reason is the architecture of, for most other solutions. This diagram shows a business protecting an Active Directory server, a database server, and some applications. Right? They're backing up over LAN speed to a server that is then storing the data on a server. Sounds good, right? But wait, as soon as you add, start to add an additional user to the mix, like food warriors or home users or branch offices and smartphones, you start to see a breakdown in the client server model. The client server model simply doesn't support fragmented data, and it's broken, right? If you're worried about more than just backing up, it gets even worse. So if you need a long-term archiving, then you need to introduce a second location, right? If you then need to add disaster recovery, right, this means 
the addition of a third location to the design. So what we see is that the client server model just isn't ideal anymore for the data landscape that we're trying to protect, at least in 2015. Now here's what we want, right? What we want to do is if we can get rid of the additional sites, so we can just worry about the site that you're protecting, and then have access to a cloud that provides um, disaster recovery, backup, and archiving services in a single solution, that's what we need, and that's what we consider ideal. And then I want to make sure that my, my solution is, is perfect for those, ward, those road warriors with tablets and smartphones, in addition to the data I'm trying to protect in the data center. And with InfraScale, you can have all of that. So let's look at this chart. And so it's labeled, don't pick one of your children to save, right? And the reason we say that is that with a lot of backup solutions, you actually do have to make a choice, right? And so with a typical um, purpose-built backup appliance, it does just that. It protects your physical servers and your virtual servers, right? And maybe some desktops. But it doesn't protect your, your road warriors um, and your mobile users. And, um, it often doesn't protect your branch offices, right? So again, it just doesn't make sense to protect only one pool of data. You need to have a solution that can protect all of your data and doesn't ignore any of it. All right, now we're on to number four. The fourth item that we need to take disaster out of disaster recovery is a solution that captures the right data in the right places. So why buy an appliance fill it up, buy another one, fill it up again, and continue this circle. That's really the old way of doing it, where more space equals more appliance. But let me tell you about the InfraScale way. So as Gartner said when they wrote about us in the Cool Vendor Report, InfraScale says that when you need more space, get a bigger cloud, not a bigger appliance, and get off that hardware hamster wheel. So what if you could get the last hardware appliance that you'd ever need, just a slim rack mount unit that uses cloud spillover technology and intelligently spills data over from the device to the cloud? Well, that would allow you to have an appliance with a four terabyte, say, limit of capacity and send 400 terabytes. So how would that actually work? Well, what Cloud Spillover does is that it understands not all data requires expensive local capacity. It spills data over to the cloud, eliminating the need to grow your local appliance as you need more capacity. So it's really push-button scalability. There's no need to provision with an additional purchase. There's no need to buy a second appliance for your replicated data store. You set the policies regarding the age and the value of the data that spilled over to the cloud. And when I say cloud, what do I actually mean by that? Well, InfraScale works with public clouds, private clouds, or third-party clouds. So we have our own solution. You can use our cloud, and we have 10, 12 excuse me, global data centers worldwide. And then we also work with private cloud architecture. So if you have your own private cloud, you can use our software and our devices in your private cloud. Or if you use a third-party cloud like AWS or Azure, you can use that as well. Great. And so the, the last way, right, to take the disaster out of disaster recovery is to find a solution that doesn't require you to be MacGyver. So, what do I mean by that? Well, the problem with a, a purpose-built backup appliance is that you get incomplete data protection. You don't get automated disaster recovery. You don't get WAN acceleration. You don't get the cloud spillover that Carl was just talking about. Um, you don't even get cloud replication. And they're generally not all that affordable. Rather than to have to cobble together multiple solutions, with InfraScale, you get all of this, and it's affordable. Now, what we, when we first developed um, our data protection appliances, um, one of the things we, we kind of centered on was to figure out, is there a way that we can have one magic box, right, that does it all, right? And so that's what we, we did with data protection appliance and what we're unveiling, um, our, our cloud failover appliances, you do get it all. You get WAN acceleration built in, all the benefits of direct to cloud backup, all the benefits of an integrated PBBA, with um, incredible deduplication power. 
and it's all in the smart cloud storage gateway that allows you to spill data over to the cloud. So again, so instead of getting more appliance, you just get a bigger cloud. All right, uh, almost through with this presentation. We have just a few minutes about InfraScale, and then we're going to dive into the Q&A. So again, remember to use that question tool to get all of your questions in, and we'll get to that in just one minute here. So a little bit about InfraScale. Um, what we believe here at InfraScale is that every company has the right to recover their data from a disaster quickly, easily, and affordably. Everyone needs the peace of mind that comes with knowing that their business data is always safe and available. So that's really important to us. That is why we do what we do. And how do we do it? Well, we use the cloud. We use smart software instead of expensive hardware. And we make DR push button simple. Now you'll see we also have an award from Gartner in 2015. I, I made mention of that just a moment ago that we made one of their five cool vendors in DR and business continuity. And a little bit more about InfraScale is that we were founded in 2006. Our headquarters is in Los Angeles, California. We have over a thousand channel partners and, our, the, and over one million devices protected. Now we integrate military grade security to make our entire data protection platform bulletproof. And military grade security, what I mean by that is that rather than other solutions, the old way that you see along the bottom here, taking raw files and simply sending them to the cloud, maybe encrypting once or twice during the process, InfraScale uses a double blind encryption system to protect data. So the InfraScale way you see along the top, as compared to the old way, is that we encrypt locally, in transit, and at rest. So it's truly the only way to ensure your data is secure. And this also allows that we can enable compliance with HIPAA, PCI, and other government regulations as well. Great. And so Oh, there was a couple questions about um, the, the data that we protect, right? And as we like to say, we have this, this dartboard, right, where on the top you have really the types of devices, the mobile devices, desktops, and laptops, and physical and virtual um, servers as well. And then along the, um, the horizontal axis is, is kind of the full range of solutions that we provide. So from um, data backup to uh, disaster recovery and archiving and even file sharing, we offer all of that with one solution. We actually protect and support more than 100 versions of the most popular operating systems, and so including Windows, Linux, Unix, VMware, etc. We support them all, and including even the, on the mobile side as well, with um, AIX and I'm sorry, uh, with with Mac and Android as well. So one of um, the reasons for this webinar was really to launch um, our newest offering called the Cloud Failover Appliance. Um, so we talk a lot about DR and a lot about disaster recovery as a service. Well, this is our entry in, into that space, right? Um, so what is the Cloud Failover Appliance? The Cloud Failover Appliance um, is a thin cloud edge device or appliance, and it's coupled with um, a full suite of uh, online DRAS or failover services, right? It offers push button functionality and comes in either a virtual or physical appliance, right? And so it allows you to quickly, easily, and affordably recover your servers and applications um, from either the cloud or the appliance. And that's somewhat novel, the ability to recover both from the cloud and the appliance. Um, Carla showed that in the, the demonstration earlier, but most solutions today will allow you to recover from the cloud or recover locally by spinning up a, a VM on the appliance. But none that we're aware of allow you to recover from both, from both places. Now, why should you care? Well, first of all, it allows you to recover your servers and applications in 15 minutes or less. In fact, we even guarantee it. Um, now, again, I should point out, if you're recovering from uh, the appliance, it's actually much faster than 15 minutes. In fact, it's in seconds. Um, it takes a little bit longer if you're recovering from the cloud. Uh, it allows um, companies to solve complex recovery scenarios with a push of a button. And when we talk about complex recovery scenarios, what we're talking about is the ability to recover 
from either micro disasters or macro disasters. A micro disaster would be something, there's just a server failure. And these are fairly sadly commonplace, but it allows you to recover from those with a push of a button. The macro uh, disasters are really the, the, the natural disasters like a tornado, flood, something like that that takes out maybe an entire site. And in that case, you're going to need a cloud boot kind of functionality to boot from the cloud, given if your primary site has been knocked out. And all of the solutions come with uh, kind of military-grade security and the encryption that comes with that. Okay, so we want to ask another poll. So get your, um, take, put the pizza down for just a, a second and help us answer this question, right? When it comes to backup and DR, which one of these is you? A, not happy with your current backup and DR system? Or B, happy with your disaster recovery but interested in our cloud failover appliance? Three, deploying new equipment and looking at a new backup system, or or you're just happy with their system and you're, you're here just to learn. I'll give you a few seconds to answer that poll. And it looks like about 50% of you have voted so far. We'll give you a minute to have the rest of you participate. Seventy percent now have voted. We have twenty-five percent of you say, say I'm not happy with my current backup in DR system. We also have another twenty-five percent that say happy with DR, but interested in your cloud failover appliance. And then we have twenty percent deploying new equipment and looking at a new backup system. Now we have over 70% in total who's voted, and 30% of you say happy with my current backup system, just learning. Those of you who aren't happy with your current backup, backup system, um, what is your current scenario? Who are you using, and um, why is it that you're not happy with that solution? Always interested in hearing feedback from you and learning more about your situation. All right, I've gone ahead and closed that poll. So what you should be seeing now is the presentation back up on the screen. Right, so what we do is we're going to walk through a demo um, uh, of our dashboard and how disaster recovery works. Right, so there we go. I think you just need to click in there, Carla. There we go. And we'll start there we go. There starts our little demo. So right now we're in the dashboard. And so someone asked earlier, like, do you have graphical representations of the data? Here you can see that. So you can show how much data is being protected. You can see your various devices that you have. It's a complete kind of one-stop shop for managing kind of all your users in one place. What we're going to do right now is we're actually going to go and choose view and manage your appliances. Right now, um, on this dashboard, you can actually see all the various appliances that you're um, backing up to, right? And we'll kind of scroll down here, and you'll see all the different kinds of devices. You could have just one, or you could have a bunch, depending on the amount of data and the number of sites you're trying to protect. What we show um, in our dashboard also is whether or not you're replicating to the cloud or not. In some cases, you may just be um, replicating to your, your data, uh, to the appliance, and then having that appliance replicate to a secondary appliance. Now, on these ones here on the right, we show that we're actually replicating to the cloud. Now, what I've done is I've clicked in here um, into the dashboard, into this specific um, VM that we're looking to cloud boot. I'm going to click the cloud boot button here, and then I'm going to go and choose the VM that I want to recover. In this case, I'm actually going to choose an exchange um, uh, VM. It's going to walk me through a little uh, wizard here and choose which of the backups do I want to back up from. So I'll choose the most recent, which is a few days ago. Um, it's then going to ask me about the IP range, right? So who can access um, these applications during an outage, right? Now, in exchange, you may leave this blank. Um, so we did. And then it allows you to put in an email address of who should be contacted once the, the, uh, the VM is spun up. So at this point, it's started. So now what we're going to do is we're going to actually go to kind of the active tab here and see whether or not it is active. And so it looks like our exchange is now currently active. And we're going to check on something really quickly here. I'm going to bring in a remote uh, desktop connection. We're going to connect to it as an admin. So just let me type in right my credentials here. Okay, great. Choose yes here. Now we're connecting via uh, 
the most desktop. One of the things that we're going to do really quickly, just to make sure that we have an internet connection. Oh, here we go. We're actually at, at the server manager for uh, Exchange. I can go through here and make any setting changes I want to make here. We're going to go ahead and actually ping Google just to ensure that we have a connection. Ping Google. Cool. And you can see, for example, we're getting a reply. So we're actually active, active and live. So you can do all of this. And all of this took literally just seconds. Um, to, to identify the, the VM you want to back up, really just click on it, and then you can have that application running um, in seconds with just a few clicks. So just let me kind of recap what you're getting with what you've seen with the cloud failover appliance. Um, we, again, as Carla mentioned, one of our missions is that we think every company should have the ability to protect and access their business under any condition, really without compromise. And so the three pillars um, uh, for cloud, uh, cloud failover appliance, let's make sure it's simple, secure, and affordable. And you've heard us repeat those, those words a few times during this presentation. By simple, we're saying it's push button simple, right? You can recover in less than 15 minutes. You can either boot on the appliance or boot in the cloud. You can protect everything. You can protect whether you're running VMware, whether it's Hyper-V, any of those kinds of, even physical environments, um, whether it be Windows or Linux. It's secure, military-grade encryption is, is baked into the solution. We even offer endpoint protection, the ability to remote wipe and geolocate devices. Um, and we even offer two-factor authentication. And then lastly, we've made it affordable, right? So unlike traditional VR systems and um, expensive high availability systems where you require lots of extra hardware, software, and bandwidth, all of that is, is essentially is baked into the solution. And you're getting disaster recovery for the price of backup. So again, you don't have to take our word for it um, as much as we'd like you to. Here's some accolades we've received from um, some press and, and analysts. So we, we've mentioned the Cool Vendor Report. Um, we've also been touted in Swartz Switzerland and, and DDNet. And um, all you have to do is literally Google uh, DRAS Disaster Recovery as a Service, and you can learn more about our solution from third party, um, whether it be press or analysts, which we've received a fair amount of press over the last couple of weeks. So I believe with that, that ends our, our presentation. Yeah, we'd love to thank everyone for joining us today. And in doing so, we'd love to offer you a free CFA evaluation unit for joining us here today. So if you'd like to take advantage of this free CFA evaluation, please use the question tool and go to webinar and let us know. You can do that by just typing in your name, your email address, and phone number, and we'll go ahead and get you set up with a free email. And CFA, again, is our cloud failover appliance, just to alleviate any confusion. So maybe it's time to dive into the questions, Carla. All right. So now let's get into the Q&A and then also our prize giveaway. So let's scroll back up to the top of the questions here. I see lots of them have come through, so this is great. All right, let's go back up to the top and see what questions have come through. And we may not get to all the questions today in, in light of time. Uh, we'll do our best to answer those. But rest assured, if you've asked a question that we don't answer today, um, we will definitely do our best um, to get those questions answered when we do follow up with you. And I see lots of um, comments really here versus questions that say, thank you for the pizza. So you're very welcome. We hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, I also see Steve's initial question, um, isn't unlimited capacity also a cost issue? Steve, I do think that we covered that in the presentation since that was asked um, in the beginning. But let us know if there are further questions on um, the unlimited capacity or cloud spillover that we discussed. Right. And, and, and there's been a number of questions regarding pricing. So I'm not going to get into the specifics of pricing, but you should just understand how our pricing works, at least at a high level. When it comes to the cloud failover appliance, there's a one-time charge for the appliance. Um, we have appliances that scale from anywhere from two terabytes of coverage to over, over, I think over 160 terabytes of, of data. So, so the price of the appliance will range depending on the amount of data that you're looking to protect. Um, if you opt for the cloud failover appliance, there's also a, a monthly charge for the failover services. And that's the ability to, to boot on the appliance, the boot ability to boot uh, in the cloud, as well as extra additional kind of cloud storage that we provide for cloud-based replication. And so 
If you're buying cloud fill over appliance, again, there's the, the per appliance cost, and then there's a monthly price for the failover services that you get. Um, and it's really just a couple hundred dollars on per, per terabyte that we're looking at. Um, so hopefully that addresses the questions regarding pricing. Okay, we also have lots of requests coming through for that uh, DRAZ report, so you'll be receiving that in your email. You'll get that shortly. There's a couple questions here regarding failover um, and how you can use it for testing. Our pricing includes a number of tests, and I believe it's 10 tests um, uh, per, per appliance per year. And so that's all baked into current pricing. I think we offer one of the richest um, uh, solutions out there for just doing tests. And ultimately, our goal is to make the tests free. Um, but right now, I think you get up to 10, 10 tests per, per uh, appliance. So there's a question that came through uh, from Andrew. He would like to know what types of reports are available. So you are able, like you saw in the demo that Dean gave, um, to manage all of this through one centralized dashboard. You can pull account usage, activity alerts, you have access to view reporting and monitoring, um, there's rebranding tools in there as well, and all the policy settings are in there as well. So it's um, one central web-based dashboard, just a single console that you can access from any browser. Great. Dennis asks, what if the appliance fails? Can you still recover everything from the cloud? The answer is absolutely, Dennis. And so if we showed you in the demo how to um, how to boot from the cloud. You ha you'll have the option to either boot from the appliance or from the cloud. So if your primary site is, um, is is swept away by a flood, you'll still have the ability to choose the cloud boot option to then choose your VMs and to replicate from the cloud. Now another question came in about um, how do we how do we differ from other kind of similar kinds of solutions, and so. There's probably a, different way, a number of different ways to answer that. Um, one of the ways is if you're looking at, for example, at, at DRAZ solutions, disaster recovery uh, as a service, one thing to look at um, when you're comparing different solutions is can they boot from the appliance and from the cloud? Often, again, they'll be limited to what they can do. Some can boot only from the appliance. Some can boot from the cloud. Um, another question is, is do they put any kind of, kind of published guarantees of, around um, how long it's going to take you to, to boot your applications when you're in that failover mode. Um, there's very few. In fact, I think, can only think of one other competitor out there that actually puts in writing a, a guarantee. So that's an important one as well. And then the other, the other key kind of um, differentiator is are you limited to the kinds of environments or VMs that you can actually boot from? So many will be able to boot VMware, you know, those, those VMs running on VMware. Um, a smaller number will be able to boot um, uh, VMs that are on Hyper-V or boot actual physical environments like Windows and Linux. So those are some of the key areas to look at if you're looking at, at a DRAZ um, scenario. The other things to look at just in general, um, kind of really beyond on pricing, is do they offer cl a cloud spillover, right? The ability to, to um, select what data stays local on the, on, on the appliance and what gets streamed to the cloud. Right. Also, what is their security story? Right. And and then those are a few of the things things to look at when you're comparing different vendors. Because again, if you're looking at a purpose-built backup appliance, they'll they'll do that function really well. Right. But they may not offer, for example, cloud spillover. They may not offer WAN acceleration. Um, they may not offer three levels of encryption. So those are the kind of questions you want to reach out and learn learn about. Okay, Andrew asks, do encrypted files remain encrypted when uploaded to the cloud? Yes, Andrew, we took a look at the encryption system, and I think we covered that. Jonathan asks, can we specify where the cloud is, US, Australia, et cetera, if we decide to use InfraSkills cloud solutions? Jonathan, yes. We have data centers, as I mentioned, 12 global data centers, uh, South Africa, Australia, London, Johannesburg, um, Melbourne, uh, we in the in Toronto, in the U.S., um, in Los Angeles, in Houston, in Dallas. Um, those are just a few of them. What type of support do you offer? Says Thomas. 
Thomas, we offer 24-7 uh, support, 365 days a year. Great. Uh, David asks, um, how do you get the image to restore, especially if it's from a physical server? So we offer um, full image backup, and you can restore the entire image as well. So that's all push button simple, and we offer that functionality as well. Jonathan asks, are you PCI compliant? Jonathan, we can enable compliance uh, with PCI, with HIPAA, with many other government regulations as well because of our uh, double-blind encryption system and other methods as well. Um, and Andrew asks, um, how do you update your software? Do admins have access um, to it in advance for testing? And so our, as a cloud company, um, our updates are, are baked into our pricing, and so those would come automatic, and we deliver those updates via our dashboard, and from there you can apply your updates. And you don't need to, to do it at a, a desktop or server level, you can do it from one place. Stephen asks, so we are encrypting the data in a way that's impossible for InfraScale to decrypt it. So Stephen, if you um, choose our ultra-safe option, then think of it like a safety deposit box at the bank where you have one key, we have one key, you need to work together and you need both keys in order to unlock that data. Daniel asked about China. I'm presuming he's asking about if we have data centers in China. Currently, um, Daniel, we do not. Um, our hope is to get there, I think, within 2016. Um, Bart asked, is this a real-time backup in DR solution, or is it based on scheduled backups or snapshots? And so um, one of the things I tried to walk through, um, Bart, uh, when we did the demo is we are spinning up um, VMs based on your backup schedule. And you can back up um, daily, you can back up hourly. You determine uh, the frequency of, of backups. And so um, if you back up on a daily basis, we're going to go to your most recent backup. Um, your most re and that's what we would spin up. And so it really is a function of how often and your, your backup schedule. Let's see here. Okay, we have a question from David. What is actually housed on the appliance? David, David, you have access to control the policies on that. So you have the ability to say what is the most critical data and also look at the time, um, the time involved with backing up that data. Yeah, and the appliance itself comes with um, all the backup software and recovery software you're going to need. Um, it comes with um, WAN acceleration built in. It includes uh, deduplication um, as well. And we can typically do, do, do deduplicate roughly 90% of the data, and so you get a 10x reduction in data at the appliance. It also includes local storage as well. Jonathan asks, is the 15 minute a guaranteed recovery time? Jonathan, yes, we do guarantee 15 minutes to um, fail over to a second location. Okay. And so um, Dennis asks, can you still guarantee 15-minute recovery if the appliance fails and all your restore is coming from the cloud? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, if we were saying we could only um, fail over from the appliance, we would actually probably give like a five-second uh, failover guarantee. Um, the reason it's 15 minutes is because that is allowing for a little bit more time to recover from the cloud. I see lots of requests for the free evaluation, and I also see a question from Thomas, how long is the evaluation period? So um, Thomas, what is your current situation at the moment? Do you already have a backup and disaster recovery solution in place, or are you looking to get started now? Um, but of course, Thomas, we'd love to have you evaluate, and, you, and please do a 14-day evaluation. So Bayani asked a couple of questions. He asked, do physical servers need not apply? No, um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that, Bayani, but the fact is we back up both physical servers and virtual servers, right? Um, he asked, will this cost more than the actual disaster? The answer is absolutely. Um, there was a study done recently where, where they pegged the cost of a disaster for an SMB um, to be roughly around $20,000 uh, an hour during an outage, right? So this is 
again, depending on the amount of data you're looking to protect, it's not going to cost you anywhere close to that. Bart asks, does this provide a mailbox level backup and restore for Exchange? Bart, yes, it does. Um, with Granular Restore, you can uh, go down to the mailbox level, even to an individual message for search and recovery. Not all solutions will do that. There's a number of questions here that ask about um, the ability to, to throttle based on bandwidth. Um, unfortunately, that's a question I can't answer, and we're going to have to get someone more technical to, to address that question regarding the ability to throttle bandwidth. I think the, the basic answer for that would be that we will not throttle um, the backups for you. We, you only do need a one megabit connection at minimum. Yeah, you know, there's a, a bunch more questions. I apologize, we're not going to get to all of them. Um, we're kind of coming up against our, our time limit today. So for, um, for people like Joshua just, that didn't think that I was seeing their questions, we were, we're just not able to get to all of them today. But when we follow up, we'll make sure that we address your questions then. Um, I just want to thank you really for your time this, um, this morning, this afternoon. Um, hopefully you got a lot out of it. Hopefully you got a lot out of it more than just the pizza itself. Um, we encourage you to, if you're looking for a copy of that report or looking a copy of a free email unit, to just, again, let us know via the, the Q&A box. Um, and with that, I think we're going to let you go. And you'll be hearing it from us one way or the other in probably within the next week or so. But again, Thank you so much for your time. Hopefully you got a lot out of the presentation. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.